Good morning. Good morning. These people are awake, but no one over here is awake, and no one's over here. So I'll try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, awesome. My name is Jermaine. I am the new uh, pastor for uh, uh, Ballinger Creek. Some of you are excited, some of you are not. Oh, I'm not sure about this. All right, so uh, uh, so glad that you're here. Thank you so much for uh, uh, praying for myself and for my family. Uh, we're up here commuting. The Horrigans have been uh, generous to let me stay up here several times a week. I do need some extra prayer because people on 95 just can't drive. Uh, uh, so some of you have experienced that, unfortunately. And uh, uh, just thank you so much. I am going to ask you to, to stand one last time. We're going to do a a prayer, actually a declaration. So go ahead and stand on up. Uh, um, this prayer, this declaration is actually in the Bible. It's known as the Shema. And I'm going to read it for you because uh, that's what it looks like. And you say, I have no idea what that says. Uh, I'm going to say it for you and then we're going to say it together and we're going to repeat and all that good stuff. And so the Shema is simply this. Shema Ya Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Achad. Okay. When you say Achad, you really got to get that phlegm in the back. And so something may come out. So apologize beforehand, before we go. So we're just going to read this together. We're going to read each uh, 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 line together. I'm going to say the first line. You're just going to repeat it after me, okay? Does that make sense? So I'm gonna, here we go. Ready? Shema Ya Israel. Shema Israel. Adonai Elohinu. Adonai Achad. All right, so this is what you said, okay? Uh, uh, this is in the Bible. It's simple. We're just going to read it together, all right? Ready? Here we go. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hey, while you sit down, why don't you go ahead and say to your neighbor that you're glad that they are here. That you're so excited that they're here. So the next line in the Shema is something you probably heard before. It's hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. Hopefully that sounds familiar. If not, it's okay. But when I was uh, 10 years old, my dad taught me how to box. He began to teach me how to box, you know, like in a ring, that whole thing. Not to defend myself, not because I want to be a bully, but he wanted to, he wanted to teach me discipline and, and competitiveness. And, and so uh, he had dreams for me to go on to boxing and golden gloves and all that other stuff. And I had a little bit of success, but I didn't like getting hit in the head. So I really kind of like put that to the side. But, but uh, there's something in every teenage boy, probably around 13 or 14, and it just, I think it's just mostly for boys. Maybe it happens with ladies, but, but mostly with, with boys around the age of 13 or, or 14, there's something that enters into a young teenage boy's mind is that they have this dream or they have this desire to, to beat up or beat their father figure or, or whoever is in that home, whoever they look to as that father figure. A am I the only one that ever had that feeling, you know? Uh, uh, maybe I, it looks like I am the only one. Uh, uh, so uh, there's something in us. I have a teenage boy right now. He's 13 and he's like trying to compete, you know, all that good stuff, but there's something in our minds. We just go crazy. We think we can beat our dad. And so I went to my dad and I challenged him. I said, hey, dad, me and you are going to box. And so uh, I took a whole week to prepare myself and, and I was, you know, I was training and I was working on my, uh, on this six punch combination. I still remember it to this day. It was a double jab. It was a jab, jab, cross. And then as I go, I'm going to go down to the body, to the body, and then I'm going to deliver an uppercut. And this wasn't any kind of uppercut. This uppercut, when I came in, I visualized this. I was practicing all week. When I come up for an uppercut, not only would I knock my dad out, but I would actually levitate him off the ground. <laughs> that's how I envisioned it. That's, that's what I saw. And so the day finally came. My mom and my sister and my brother, they left, and, and so we went downstairs, and I had my headgear on and my gloves. He didn't have any headgear on, and, and I just visualized that I'm, gonna, I'm going to knock my dad out. And, and, and I just thought about this. I was like, okay, I've been training all this time. He's really not training, and I'm fast. My trainer, he said I was really fast. I had a great jab, and, and I was just doing well. I had all this confidence. I'm going to knock my, I'm going to levitate my dad off the ground. This is going to be awesome. And I'm thinking to myself, 
over and over again, I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to tell everybody this incredible story. When I get older, I beat up my dad when I was 13. Plus, I was faster. I was younger. My dad was old. I was 13. He was like 36. I mean, he was old. And so in my mind, I was going to beat him. And so and so we get downstairs, and he goes to his side, and I go to my side, and he had a clock on his side, and we, we did three minutes rounds. So, you know, we're going to do three rounds of three minutes, and, and he, as soon as he hit the timer, I run over there because I wanted to take the center of the ring, and I just start going. Before I go, I go, ding, ding, and I go over there. This is what love is going to feel like, and I go, bup, 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 bup. and then I finally calm down, and I take the middle of the ring, and, and I'm just sticking with my jab, and I jab, and, and there's a distinct sound that when you, you throw a jab correctly, and it makes contact, there's a distinct sound. Not only that, your, the person's head goes back, and I'm hitting my dad, and he's throwing a shot. I'm like, man, that's slow. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. And I'm hitting him, and then I'm finally setting him up for my six-punch combination. It's going to be beautiful. I'm waiting for his shoulder to dip, and finally that shoulder dip, and I go in for it. I go double jab, one, two, and then I, and I do a cross, and I think I landed like twice. Then I go down to the body, and then, incredible, I actually see his arm go over my head while I go down, and then, and then I'm, I'm like, forget this, forget the five punch, or excuse me, forget the six punch, I'm gonna deliver a five punch, I'm gonna knock him out, so I don't even need the body, I'm coming up with that uppercut, levitate off the ground, this is gonna be beautiful, and this is where my dad cheated. <laughs> because somehow he grew an extra arm, and so as I come up, he hit me so hard in the head that, that literally I hit the wall. I didn't stay on the wall. I bounced back, okay? I bounced back into the middle, and then he delivered a body shot, and I just hit the ground. And he comes over to me, and I was out. He comes over to me, and he says, I think two or three days, first thing, he said, did I break a rib? And I'm like, no, no, no. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to tell mommy. You know, it's like, so I'm there on the ground, and the second thing he says, Ding, ding. <laughs> That's what love feels like. I mean, we use that word a lot, love, right? I, I, I love that restaurant. I love that story. I, I, love, I love that song. I love my favorite team. Oh, yeah, by the way, I love my wife, and I, and I love my kids. I love my family. Love is big business. All you have to do is turn on your radio or go down to the local movie theater. Love is, is everywhere. I mean, if you really love somebody, you'll sit through one of those Hallmark movies, whether you like it or not. I mean, love is everywhere, everywhere. And no matter your background or where you're from, we all have a desire to be loved and a desire to love. It's in our DNA. It's, it's how we are created. And as a result, our our culture has, has created this or is infatuated with the I, idea of, of love. And, and we've been in this book, rather this, this letter known as 1 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians, and it's written by this guy named Paul. And he's writing this letter to this church community that, that is this, in this radical and cool and hip city known as, as Corinth. And this letter is, is not some kind of love letter or some kind of encouragement letter like, oh my goodness, I miss you guys, write me, text me, call me, tag me, like me. It's not like that at all. Rather, Paul's tone in this letter is like, hey guys, what's, what's going on over there? I, I've, I've been hearing things and I'm hearing that you're, you guys are all not living well. And of course, not living well according to scripture, according to God is not, not loving well. And what's going on here, this community, this church community, they got caught up in competing and, and comparing and gossiping and, and full of envy and jealousy. So, so Paul begins to talk to them about the single most distinguishing factor of the Christian community. And, and no, it's not devotion or it's not its dress code or it's music or, hey, look what I can do, but rather it is, it's love. And so we arrive at, at 1 Corinthians 13, which if, you, if for those of you who aren't familiar with the, with the Christian culture or the Christian community, I mean, 1 Corinthians 13 is it's like a beloved passage of ours in the church. I mean, we call this the love chapter. We read this ver these verses in weddings. We, we get these verses done in calligraphy, and we, put them in, we frame them, and we put them in our homes. Uh, but as we look at the text today, we, we need to realize that, that Paul is, is really using this entire letter particularly this passage, this section, as a, 
a mirror to show them, show them who, who they really are and, and how they are really living. And so if you have your Bibles or if you have your phone, turn to 1 Corinthians 13. We'll, we'll put actually the verses on the screen for those who don't have those. But we're just going to read through this and this incredible passage. So let's dive right in. Starting at verse 1, it says, this is Paul speaking. He says, if I can speak in the tongues of men. Now, now what he's talking about, he's saying, hey, if I can speak every language known to man, Right now, to this day, we know that there are 6,500 different languages in our world. So Paul's saying, man, if I can speak every language in the world, and oh yeah, by the way, speak the, angel, speak the language of angels, whatever that is, but do not have love. I'm the, uh, only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If, if I could give prophecy, it says in verse 2, and can fathom all mystery and all knowledge. In other words, if, if, I, if I know everything in the past, if I can know everything in the present and even know the things of the future, and on top of that, if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If, if, if I give all I possess to the poor and even give my body over to hardship, in other words, to be persecuted, dare I say even die, that I may boast but do not have love, I, I gain nothing. Duh, you're dead, okay? Verse 4 says, love is patient. Love is kind. In other words, are you patient? Are you kind? Love, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrong. How ridiculous does that sound? And most likely, this entire letter was read out loud, and so someone, maybe several people said, hold on a second, TV time out, that sounds a lot like us. And so in a clever way, Paul is, is saying, hey, I've heard reports about you. You're not patient. You're not, you're not kind. You're, you're rude. You're mean. You're arrogant. You're, you're irritable. You're resentful. He says, this is what I heard about y'all. Uh, uh, do you guys use the word y'all here in, in Maryland? Uh, down in Virginia, it's like all y'all. Okay, It's like a double. And like I'm just from like New Jersey. It's just you. Hey, you. Sometimes we say, hey, youths. You know, so you remember the movie? Okay, hey, you. Like, okay, anyway, verse 6. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Verse 7, it, it, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I, I love what this other translation says. This is the English Standard Version. It says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all these. And as I read this entire list, I mean, man, that's a lot. I'm like... Paul, are you saying that I need to be more patient, I need to be more kind, I'm not supposed to be envious, I'm not, stop boasting, quit being arrogant, don't be rude, don't insist on my own way, don't be irritable, don't, don't rejoice at wrongdoings, just bear all things all the time, believe all things all the time, hope all things all the time, endure all things all the time. Whew, that's a lot. I'm just tired of reading this. And I'm just at church, and I, I'm trying to be more patient, but boy, are these services really long and Man, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be kind, but man, my boss is a real jerk, and, and I'm trying to believe all things, but people are just mean and, and bad and, and rude, and so when I look at this list, I don't know if, if you're like me, i just like, man, I'm so far from this life. How in the world can I do this? Well, the word love that, that Paul is using here is this ancient word. Maybe you've heard it before. It's this word agape. Everyone say Agape. One more time, agape. One more time. Agape, agape this agape love means, means this divine love. It's a, it's a love that only originates or comes from, from God. This agape love, it's unconditional, it's relentless. There is no need for reciprocation. It's just love, no reserve, no hesitation. It, 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 it's agape. Everyone say Agape. It's supernatural and divine. So you have agape that Paul uses. And there's another word for love that many of us are familiar with. It's, it's known as 
phileo, it's, it's what you and I are familiar with. If you're married, phileo is the reason why you're married. It's, it's brotherly love. It's friendship love. It's phileo. I mean, maybe you didn't want to come to church this morning, uh, uh, but since you're in phileo, you're here. You know, you love a guy, or you love a girl, or you love your mom, and, and phileo, is, phileo is why you're here. Phileo is what all the, the pop songs are about. You've got agape, and you've got phileo. And these Corinthian church people aren't even doing good with this phileo, common love, like open the door saying please and, and thank you. They're not even doing good with that. So Paul's like challenging with this. It's like how in the world are we going to do this agape, unconditional, no reserve kind of love? We can't even do common love right. I mean, I mean and I love what, what Paul is doing here. It's it's brilliant, in fact. In fact, Jesus often did this in his teachings, and this is kind of the, the first idea. So if you're a note taker, you can write this down. If not, that's okay. But this, the first idea that, that helps us understand what this agape love or, or this idea about what agape love really is, this, this agape love, it, it forces us, forces you and me to come to the end of ourselves. In other words, as you look at this list, you know, be kind, you don't be arrogant, you don't, don't be rude, uh, don't keep any records of the wrongs. It's like, I, I can't do any of this stuff. I mean, I, I can't be any of this stuff. I mean, you come to that quick realization, I, I need help. Dare I say, I need a hero. Remember that song? I need a hero. I don't know the rest of the song tonight. I mean, I mean that's what it comes to my mind. I need a, a savior. Because, Paul, what you're saying here, what you're proposing is absolutely and utterly ridiculous. I'm just here trying to make my marriage work. I'm trying to respect my teacher or, or my boss. I'm just trying to love my neighbor who keeps taking three feet of my property with his fence. I mean, agape love with no conditions, no restrictions, that's just crazy. Come on. God, I'm just down here trying to pump out a little phileo, and you're asking me to go all agape? This is ridiculous. This is crazy. In fact, God, I got a problem here. Explain this to me. God, why, why does it always seem like you're asking me to do things that I cannot do? Interesting. God, you're always asking me to do things that I cannot do. And God's like, yeah, that's the point. God's like, you can't do any of this stuff without me. I mean, wouldn't it be just like God to tell you and I to do something that we can't do without him? I mean, this passage, the entire gospel, is not about trying harder or doing better or being smarter, but rather the premise of this passage and even this section is that you and I would actually experience transformation, that you and I would actually experience, encounter, and accept this agape ridiculous, unconditional, reckless love of Jesus that you and I would get to the point where we say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I, I, I absolutely need you. So agape love forces us to come to the, to the end of ourselves. The second idea from this passage, agape love, Love, it sets us free through, through Jesus Christ. I, I, love what, I love what 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says. It, it, it basically says, hey, I, you're, I'm freeing you from your past, from, from your sins, from your shame, because the score has been set. Listen, I just, I'm just going to read this. Just listen to it. It says this love is, is not self-seeking. It's, it's not easily angered, and it keeps no records of wrongs. How crazy is that? Because according to our world, this is totally opposite because our world defines love. Man, I'll love you until you do something wrong or you do something I don't like. And I may love you back, but there will be some conditions. And I might forgive you as, as, as long as you do certain things, but I'll never, I'll never forget. Uh, but this reckless Agape love of God, it, it doesn't remember your sins. It, 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 he forgives. Not only does he forgive, he loves and he sets us free. 
In fact, I got to add on to that little kind of note. Maybe you can add on to me. Not only does this reckless agape love that Paul talks about sets us free, it also keeps us free. I love what it says in verse 7. It'll be on your screen. I love this. It says, love always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. There's a lot of people who are saved. They call themselves Christians, and maybe even in this room, they have been set free, but, but they're not, their today is not ideal. Maybe they still are trapped in this little kind of prison that they've created themselves. Maybe all the, the ducks aren't in a row. They're just kind of still waiting for certain things. And so there's a lot of Christians who, who sit in this anxious position, not secure in the love of God. Maybe you know someone like that. They, they, the God's love, they say, you know, God's love used to protect me, but now I'm in this new season. I'm in this waiting season. Things are not going my way, and they're wondering if God's love will ever come through. I, I think about that, and I think about, uh, you know, some people and how they have a relationship with another person, and they're always I- anxious, and maybe they're insecure about that relationship because they're not sure if that, that love is unconditional. Maybe they just started out dating and, and they're unsure if this love is, is real. And so they, they're, they're trying to figure things out. They're always on pins and, and needles. They're actually scared of oh, what to say or what they do because they, they think that somehow, some way, God's love is going to change. But, but I'll just tell you right now, God is not that fickle. I mean, his love, his love remains. His love remains. And there's a lot of Christians still dealing with bad theology as if the stuff that we are doing is what brings the love of God towards our lives, rather just uh, focusing on who God is, better yet, what God has, has done. Because if I believe in Jesus Christ, if I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, he takes residency in my life. Because I have Jesus in my life, hear me on this, maybe you forget everything today, because I had Jesus in my life, I'm not waiting for breakthrough if I've already had breakthrough. I, I'm, not, I'm not waiting for a promotion. He is my promotion. I'm not waiting for anyone to validate me. The cross validates me. This reckless, incredible love sets us free, but it also keeps us free. So even though we are waiting for this next season to unfold, just remaining in God's word and focusing on him and and just waiting with him as he he protects me in this season and knowing that his his love never, ever changes. And and I don't feel like like my love, my my prayers or my worship is like some kind of interview, better yet, some kind of like contest, like I'm auditioning for God, like on the voice, you know, like you're on the voice and all of a sudden your prayer, you're like, Boof, you know, God's like, I accept that prayer, you know? It's like, God's not like that. Man, he just, he, he, this love is unconditional. It's crazy. It's ridiculous. It's reckless. God's love, this agape love sets us free and it, and it keeps us free. It goes on in verse 8. I love what Paul does here. He says, love never fails. Sometimes it says love never ends, but, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where, where there is knowledge, it will pass away. I don't think Paul, and a lot of people look at this verse and they base a whole theology on this. I don't think Paul is talking about any of these things kind of going away. He's talking about something much, much bigger here. It's incredible. Look what he says in verse 9. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy. We don't have the, the whole picture, but there will be a time when we get the big picture. Verse 10, it says, but when completeness comes. He's talking about a full revelation of Jesus. When we get this full picture of who God really, really is, what is in part disappears. And then he uses this, his own illustration in verse 11. He says, when I was a child, I, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I, I reasoned like a child. But, but when I became a man, I put away uh, the ways of childhood behind me. I I have several kids, and they're all teenagers, and I love them. And, and when I read this verse, I think of them, and I think of who they are and our interaction. And, and maybe you've had the same interaction with your own children. And, and I, when I think about this passage, I think about, like, man, okay, I put away a childish 
things, and I've even remembered when I was younger, and, and, and maybe this is true in your family, but, but with my kids, I know that they love me and I love them, but, but they're, my kids are, maybe this is true, they're always asking for stuff. Anybody here, you know, the, your kids are always asking for stuff, and dare I say, my kids don't use this a lot, but they have, like, they, they'll, they'll try to, you know, persuade you or guilt you. If you love me, you will get, you know, anybody ever, or this, I just have that problem. You know, I guess I just have that problem. I mean, we all have that, right? I mean, I mean, we, and sometimes we can know how silly that is and how foolish that is, but we can be the same way when it comes to God. God, if you love me, you will work this thing out. And, and it's, it's, you shouldn't be fearful in going to God. We should go to God in prayer, but, but sometimes we just need to go to God and not look for a handout for him, but just go to God because he's God. I have this picture of, of us going to God, not just going to his hands, but going to God and just being around his feet. It's a, it's a different position. And so Paul's like, man, this is, this is bigger than, than what you think. And, and, and he kind of illustrates this in verse 12. He says, for, for now we see only a reflection as in the mirror. And I love what he says here. Then, then we shall see face to face. I love this picture, and what he's doing is he's going like back into the, what they call the Old Testament. He's, he's, he's bringing up this story between God and Moses. And, and what we know about Moses, Moses had this incredible relationship with God. I mean, you, you read some of the Old Testament, and you're like, man, how, man, how does God and, and Moses have this incredible and wonderful relationship? And, and Paul's challenging us. He said, man, God wants that relationship with you as well, this, this face to face. And, and when I think about my relationship with God, my fellowship with God, I, I know it's pretty good. And I'm always like, okay, I wanted it to be better. But, but what but Paul is talking about, and, and I can't even fathom this, he's talking about unhindered fellowship with God. I can't even imagine what that is. I mean, like no, nothing between us. We, it's just unhindered. We just, we're just going forward. We're having this great relationship. And it's just like, that, that's what heaven is going to be like. That we, we can have this incredible relationship with the God, the creator of the universe, just unhindered fellowship. And he goes on, he says, now I know in part, and then I shall fully know, even as I am fully known. Verse 13, many of us maybe have heard this before, and now there are three, these three remains, faith, hope, and love. When, when you get to heaven, there, there will not be faith, and there will not be hope. There will just be love. But the greatest of these is, is love, and, and this last idea, this last point about this agape love, not only does it, does it forces us to come to the end of ourselves, not only does it set us free, but, but this agape love, it challenges you and me to, to live heaven bound, to live heaven bound. One year, uh, one of our kids, they were about eight years old, seven years old, and they got a whole bunch of uh, money from uh, their nana. That's what we call my mom, their grandma, they call her nana, and, and we teach our kids to, to tithe, and, and Sunday was, was approaching, we, you know, we say, hey, you know, of this gift that you got, don't forget to, to tithe a portion of it and, and, and keep some for yourself, and then you're going to save a little bit. We just, we just believed in, in doing that at a young age, so we wanted to teach them, and, and this, this seven-year-old comes to me, and she, and she says, Dad, I, I just want to give it all. I'm like, what? And she's like, yeah, I just, I just feel like I just, I just need to do it, give it all. And I'm like, okay, what? I'm not sure even how to deal with that. I say, honey, you don't have to give it all. I mean, you could, you could save some for yourself. You, you know, give God what is God's. And I say, okay, let, let's just pray, pray about this and pray through this. And, and I just totally forgot. Sunday came and, and after the service, after children's church, she came up to me after me. She says, Dad, I did it. I did it. I did it. And I go, what? She says, I just, I just gave it all. I gave all the money now that I gave. I just gave it all to God. And I was like, oh, man, that's, that's awesome. Okay, what, what, how did you do that? And 
I'm, and I'm have, trying to have this conversation with this, this seven-year-old. I'm like, how in the world can, can you do this? How in the world can you do this, do this a thing of generosity that you just gave it all? And, and she said in so many words, Dad, it's, it's really simple for me. It, it, I just figured I, I can give it everything I have because if I need more, I just ask you, Daddy. <laughs> Agape love challenges us to, to live, to live heaven-bound, and living heaven-bound is not just loving God with, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, but, but it's also loving our neighbor. I mean, Jesus said this, allowing uh, the love of Christ to flow in you and, and out of you, and even when you're running weary or you're running on empty, you're, you ask your heavenly father, like, like, help me get through this. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. I need your know-how. Loving, heaven-bound is, is loving on people today, even the people that are unlovable. I mean, living Heaven bound is not just saying, man, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm great. I got first class seats. I can't wait till I get there. But it's like also loving on people today, showing that agape love that God has given us and just loving on people around you. And this is kind of like the challenge of the day. And, and my challenge to you is just to take Take one step in this agape love. Whatever that step may be, maybe, just maybe, it's taking that step and, and say, okay, Jesus, uh, I'm going to accept you. I'm not really sure what that entails, but I'm going to accept you. I'm going to receive you as my Lord and as my, my Savior. I'm going to take that first step w- with you, and, and please help me figure this out. But I, wanna, I want this kind of love. I'm not sure if I can deliver, but I, that, that's, that's what, what I want. And, and maybe your step is, is being secure in God's love. And a great way to remind you to be secure and stay secure that God loves you is, is getting involved in what we call home groups. Having people around you just, just speaking into you, loving you, helping you, sharing you, smiling with you, laughing, and even crying with you, taking that step, and, and maybe you just sit quiet for a while, and, and after a while, you're like, okay, uh, this is what's going on in my life. I mean, there's other people around you that want to speak into your life, and then maybe God's like, I'm, I'm going to use you. I'm going to take that love that I poured in you to, to love on people that you like, that you love, and even the people that you don't like, and you don't love. Maybe it's it's getting involved. I know the last several weeks we've been talking about this, maybe serving in youth ministry with, with a team down there and Pastor Steve, and you're like, I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. I, that's okay. They, they can teach you. And, and their kids, they're, they're teenagers, they're scary, but we all were there, right? Uh, maybe it's serving in children's ministry. And I know Pastor Guy talked about that last week, getting involved and, and pouring out the love that God has given you on, onto others. And, and maybe you don't like kids. That's okay. Maybe you serve as an usher or a greeter, and, you, and, and your whole goal is like everyone who walks through these doors, I want them to know there's a smiling face that just like, they're loved here. They're just loved here. Easter is quickly approaching, and, and maybe today you start praying about the person or the persons that you're going to, to invite. Maybe it's serving inside the church. Maybe it's serving outside the church. Uh, if you haven't heard, we're trying to uh, get this campus going. So maybe God's like, I, I, I'll go. <laughs> Just out of my wheelhouse, I'll go. I, I want to help this community. I want to reach this community. I don't know, but, but I do know that God has poured into you, infused into you this agape, crazy, reckless love. And he wants you to pour that out to people right around you. Maybe it's something small. Maybe it's something huge. But, but just imagine, imagine with me, this, not this city, but this whole county transformed because of this agape love. Because people, Because God likes to use ordinary people, just like you and me, 
who don't have a bunch of skill, but is just willing to just go for it. Give our all. This incredible, agape, ridiculous, and reckless love. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for who you are. Not only for who you are, but what you have, have done. How you died on the cross for the sins in the world. That includes my sins and everyone in here's sins. You, you've done that. You, you showed us this agape, reckless love. And now you challenge us to live the same. And there may be some people here, Lord God, that have never accepted you as their Lord and, and Savior. Maybe today is the day where they take that step. They haven't figured everything out. They're not even sure what's next, but they say, okay, I, I want that lo kind of love. I want that kind of relationship. I need that kind of, they say, just say, Jesus, I need you. And if that is you today, maybe you just pray this prayer in the, in the privacy of your heart. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want, to, I want you to be my Lord and Savior of my life. I want to be yours and I want you to be, to be mine. Forgive me, love me. I want to be on your team, Lord Jesus. And if you pray that prayer, I, I'll be up here afterwards. Pastor Matt will be up here afterwards. You want to talk, you want to find out what the next steps is. You're, you're maybe even not even sure how to, to pray that. And whatever that may be, we'll be here to, to journey with you. Maybe you're here and you're You've already done that, and maybe you're not in the greatest of places. Maybe you don't feel secure in God's love. I'll be up here often, or maybe you just oh, 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 want to talk, but, but know this, you are secure in God's love. God is not that fickle. Or maybe you're ready to receive that challenge and taking a step outside of your norm and just loving on people that, that maybe they don't look like you, they don't act like you, but they, they need that love that you have. So Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you for the people here. I thank you for this church. I thank you, Lord God, the impact uh, that you will be making through every individual here, Lord God. To not only reach uh, the city, to reach this county, and even beyond. We thank you, Lord God, for your incredible, ridiculous and reckless love. We pray this in your Lord, in your name. Amen.